Welcome to today's workshop. Uh, we're going to talk about ETL, ELT. We're talking about data streaming and working with Mage of creating data pipelines. For this workshop, I have with me uh, Tommy Dang, who is going to lead us through this, show us a bit about Mage and how they do it. I tried Mage. I don't know if you have seen it in, on my YouTube channel. Um, I really like it. It's a straightforward solution, very nice with the graphical interface and so on. So I'm excited. Let me bring in Tommy. Hey, everyone. Hey, hey. how's it going? Hey, I'm Hi. excited to be here. Yeah, great to have you here. I already see there are people in the stream, so I think we can start right away. Um, maybe if you like to say a few words about your journey here to where you're right now with me. Yeah, absolutely. Would, would love to. I, I started at Airbnb in 2000, early 2015 as a software engineer. I worked on uh, internal tools, dev tools. I then started moving into data engineering and then started working on data tools, data infrastructure. And so I was at Airbnb for a little over five years. And then I, I left in late 2020, started Mage in 2021. Cool. What, what what got you to that point? Like, I think I guess it's a big step, right? Uh, I'm going to leave and then you're starting a, a company. You had most likely an idea. Like, what was the, the thought behind it? Like, how yes, the thought is you know, I just saw an opportunity to help other developers and seeing the tooling that can be done. The problems you solve at a large company can be extrapolated and applied at many different other companies that might not have the same amount of resources. Mm. Ah, that's true. That's very true. <laughs> um, let me let, let us quickly say hi to the chat before we continue. Before we continue, hi everybody. I already right. see here. Eka is here. Hari, hello Hari. Andrea is here. Say yeah. name. Nice. Um, no, Andreas. It was George. Hello. Yeah. If you have questions, everybody in the chat. If you have questions, we are doing a round in the end with Q and A, but put them in the chat immediately because I'm yes. going to see them here. And whenever something interesting is popping up, we're going to like fire everything at Tommy immediately. Yes. And so maybe in this that, way we can also steer him into oh, there are some details that, you guys want to know and, and he can answer. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. let's make it interactive. So anytime anyone just jump in, ask any questions. It could be about me, it could be about anything else. Uh, happy to answer. It'd be yeah. fun. We'll make it fun. Very cool. Yeah, I, I see a lot of hellos. Yeah. Nice to have you here. Um, yeah, we were in the title. There are like we were talking about, it's about plumbing and pipelines and so <laughs> on. Like maybe not everybody is very familiar with data pipelines and what these are. Can Maybe we could start with a few words about data pipelines. How do you see this? Yeah, and, absolutely. And what are they? Absolutely. So if you think of a pipeline, there's a start and an end. So it's somewhat linear, but it can branch out and have different nodes or different branches, but it eventually ends, right? The, the water eventually comes out one side, even if there's poop in the middle of those pipelines. And so for a data pipeline, it is you have data somewhere and you can do something to it along the way, but it eventually finishes and rests somewhere else at the very end. And so use cases of a data pipeline could be, you mentioned earlier, ETL. Let's take data from somewhere, let's transform it in the pipe, and then let's output it at the end of the pipe to, let's say, a data lake or a data warehouse. Another use case could just be replicating data. Maybe you have a bunch of tables, application data, and you want to replicate it, version it, partition it, or let's say you want to train models. So you need to have a pipeline that takes data from various sources, and then you want to combine them and transform them, prepare them for machine learning or analytics. So those mm. data pipelines can be used for, uh, it's a quite broad term, but it's meant to, it's a concept of taking data, doing something to it, and then putting it somewhere else. Yeah, in the in the video that I've created, I demoed the ETL use case. I think the ETL is is the most standard one, right? That's everybody does that or, or knows 
knows what this is. Yes. Uh, what, what's your view on EDL? Is that still going to be a thing in, in like five years or is everything going to move to, towards streaming, towards ELT? So I, I still think ET, it, that also is a very gen generic concept as well. You extract something, you transform it somewhere, and then you load it somewhere. Or the other one is extract, load, then transform. I think it's, it really depends on your use case. Sometimes you can transform on the fly. Maybe you can do, you want to do row by row transformation. You don't need, it, it doesn't need the entire set to calculate. But then in other cases, let's say you wanted to do like a moving average on uh, someone's clicks on your web page or visits or time on your page. Well, if you want to do a moving average, you need to collect all the data for the user over seven days. And then you can do transformations on that. So you have to do the ELT first. But there's applications for both. And if, if we think about, uh, I understand there's some talk in the space where other uh, other cloud providers will you know the zero ETL. What they're doing is is nice. They're making it easier to sync data from their own apps into their proprietary warehouses, data lakes, etc. That's going to be useful. But what about all the sources that aren't on that cloud? And and I know quite a few people who yes they use BigQuery, but they might also use other databases outside of they might have multi-cloud so i still think there's going to be a world where a little bit of etl yeah <laughs> it's also the the simplest thing right the straightforward yeah. most likely you learn that in, in in school first okay here we have a source <laughs> do a transformation clean it you already mentioned yes. like the poop in the middle that happens a lot yeah <laughs> and oh uh, yeah that's that's an, an that's an important part because some some people I, I see this all the time on LinkedIn. I don't know if you have seen this as well that people like say, "Wow, oh, ETL is is old thing. It's, everything is going to move towards streaming." Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, you mentioned um, use cases. It, it very much depends on the use case. Yep. So, like, what are what are some use cases that you see are people actually doing with with tools like like Mage or General oh, yes. when they build pipelines? What, yep, yep. what type of, of things are these? Yeah, so sometimes people just want to replicate data from, let's say, their Postgres to Snowflake. So they set up a data integration pipeline. Sometimes folks already have their data in, let's say, a data warehouse like Snowflake or uh, S3 using Delta Lake or Iceberg, and they need to join it with third-party data or data that they've ingested from an API. So they'll do transformations there as well. People people train models as well. You, you can train models. Now, uh, of course, we focus on just the, the data aspect of it, but we do have some use cases where people are building training sets, uh, building pipelines for the training sets, and then eventually trains trains models. So it's a, it's a quite broad spectrum, but the main two that we see is the, the E and the L, and then separately the T. And we also have folks who, you know, they use DBT. And so we have a very deep and native integration with DBT. So orchestrating all your DBT models, but also being able to mix in non-DBT models. Let's say you wanted to write some Python to do some transformation calculation or some ingestion. You can combine mm -hmm. those two together as well. Mm -hmm. We already there was already a question here about the like uh, the it's a big question. I don't want to bring it in about if file sensors and batch operators like the connections to other platforms because you mentioned this be earlier. You said mm -hmm. you're with the cloud, you're not just working on that cloud. Maybe you're also integrating other, other clouds, other tools to it, right? And that's that's important. How how, yeah. how did you go at this? Yes. Yeah, so image? the we so similar to the sensors that uh, the users uh, the person's talking about. We do have a sensors. Uh, it, the the idea of operators. What we do is. We provide templates 
to remove a lot of boilerplate code for you. And so let's say you wanted to load data from BigQuery. You could obviously write out the code yourself, you know, import the Google BigQuery client, authenticate, et cetera. We make this very easy for you. You can, we provide a bunch of templates that you can just say, hey, load data, BigQuery, and we'll have that code pre-written for you. And obviously mm -hmm. you can change it if you want, you can customize it, you can edit it. So we don't obfuscate what's going on. Uh, we just make it more convenient and faster for you to, to build out. Nice. Yeah. Also, how does that, like, how does that work with, with machine learning? Because we were talking about pipelines yeah. and, and use cases. Whenever I, I think about these tools, whenever we talk about ETL, ELT and so on, people don't immediately think about machine learning. They always think about, oh, we're doing the, the engineering, we're not doing the, the training and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, are you seeing people doing this with Mage and, and like building their whole process around, around it? So we do see the biggest part of ML is always the data. Uh, that's always been the hardest part, the part that takes the longest. And so we do see folks use Mage at least to bring in the data and then combine it, organize it, even potentially build features with the little transformation, the aggregations, right? That features are actually quite valuable, not just for machine learning models, but for analytics, for reporting. And then you take that one step further and just combining a bunch of features, you can create a training set. And then that training set can eventually be used for machine learning models. So we do focus, we, we see a lot of folks work on the data preparation. That's, that's, that's the big thing. That's the thing that takes the most time in machine learning. So they do a lot of the data preparation, whether they know it or not, whether they know they're going to eventually use it for machine learning or not. But that's step one. We have to get good data preparation, good data cleaning as well, good versioning, partitioning. And then you'll be able to get to a place where you have your data already cataloged, already prepared if you ever want to use machine learning. Hmm. Um, I think you, you prepared something like a, a bit about, because I, I feel like we should get a bit into why yeah. mage, what is it? Because we're already touching at it. And, and you, you said you prepared a few slides on it. So I yes. think we should, we should move into these. Let me, let me bring these yeah. up one sec. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. So I do want to share a little bit of some fun facts about, you know, Airflow because we, we use it a lot and we learned a lot from it. You know, when I was at Airbnb, it started in 2014, open source in 2015. To date, it has at least nine data engineers just on the Airflow team. And there's a little over 14,000 DAGs running there right now. So what are some challenges that we faced when we were there. So running locally, it was it was quite difficult to run this locally. If you wanted to, you can run it locally, but then it would load all your all the DAGs. So it would take it would be very, very slow. So what others would do is they would use a shared staging or a shared instance on EC2. Another challenge we had was reusing code. So for those that have used Airflow before, you know, you can write your, import your DAGs, import your task, however you want. It's, it's unopinionated on the way you structure your code, except everything goes in DAGs. And yes, you can write utility functions and then import them, but not everybody, not everybody does that. And so reusing other people's tasks, they, it's quite difficult because they will write them in line their DAG file, and then you have to import their entire DAG file over or refactor it. So it was, it was challenging to reuse. Also, passing data between tasks, you know, there's XCOMs, uh, but that was challenging in itself, especially since the way we ran Airflow, you, it was in, it was really early on before we had even Kubernetes pod. But also, I think the I think XCOMs are not really meant to uh, 
transfer a lot of data between tasks, yes. right? It's, yes. it's more exactly. for metadata than, than for, for, for large amounts of yes. data. So nice. Thanks. Good call out. Also testing. So I, I shared before running it locally is tricky. So you have to write out your DAG and then you have to see, you sync your code to a remote files, a remote file system. And then you go through the staging UI, go through there and then activate your DAG and then run it. But if you sync code and remember it's syncing a lot of code, let's say you had a typo, then you'll get that, that banner, that red banner uh, on airflow telling you something's wrong. So it was uh, that you could test it. It's just the iterative speed was a little slow. Mm. Also maintaining workers. It was quite challenging to just constantly scale up, maintain debug. Oh yeah. This one debugging task as well. The, we have the logs. Those, those are a little hard to read at times. Also, you'd have to, when the logs write out, if you don't properly store them correctly, going backwards to find those logs for a certain failed task in the past can, uh, can be hard. So what is Mage? We talked about a little bit about it before, but Mage is a data pipeline tool for transforming and integrating data. Our mission is to make data engineering more accessible. So I want to share with you our four core design principles. This is behind every decision that we make, every feature that we make. So our top one, easy developer experience. We really, really focus on making it easier, faster for the end developer to build data pipelines. And how this comes out in the features, you'll see that you have this IDE, this notebook-like experience when you build the pipelines where you can interact with your code. You can run it immediately and see the results. Those are just one of the ways we make it easy. Another one is we make it easy for you to mix and match SQL and Python and R and in the future, other languages. That's actually something that I found interesting because at some point I had to learn Airflow as well. And the learning curve between airflow and mage is very different like <laughs> i think airflow has a very steep learning curve you you need to have a lot of background knowledge and how does it work and and with with mage it was just okay here are, this is how i click the things together and this is how i connect each individual stage with the other and this was was pretty simple so that's yeah that's a big a very important thing Awesome. Awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad you feel the same. Another core design principle is engineering best practices uh, built in. And so we, and as I go through the UI later, you'll see, we make it really easy for you to reuse code. Every step in your pipeline, we call a block and a block maps to an individual file. We also make data validation is really easy, testing your, testing your code and then testing your data. We treat data as a first class citizen. Everything's all about data. Everything's about producing data, operating on data. And so some of the features we have where we treat data as a first class citizen is every block, right? Every step in your pipeline will output data and that data serialized and then eventually deserialized for other downstream blocks. We also have automatic partitioning, versioning, and backfilling. And last, we make scaling simple. I shared before, there's nine data engineers just supporting Airflow. We're, our aim is to make it so easy for a non-DevOps person, non-info person to be able to launch Mage to any major cloud provider and to be able to easily scale it up and maintain it. So, so as a solo developer, and some of these include, we, we provide Terraform templates to deploy Mage to EKS, ECS. So the native container services or the Kubernetes services and the major cloud providers and, and just about two commands. Also, we have native integration with Spark. So you can write PySpark code and then run that code on a, a standalone cluster, a remote cluster, uh, Databricks, et cetera. That's 
That's, cool. uh, those are the things I wanted to share a little bit. About. <laughs> I think, okay, let, let's quickly leave this here. Um, I feel, would you say like that data as a first class citizen, that's something that has been missing? For, I think a lot of things have been missing. I think the easy developer experience, it, we can always, other tools, other people can always make the developer experience easier and easier. But how I like to think about it, there's a coding experience. So that's the, how you structure the APIs, how you structure uh, whatever syntax you need that's specific to your library. And then there's also the, the user experience or the, the, the way you navigate a graphical user interface, the way you monitor, things like that. I think that part is missing. Engineering best practices, I, I came originally from a software engineering background and I think there's a lot of great practices, like a lot of the solid uh, principles, single responsibility, things like that, testability, observability. I think a lot of that, you know, you do see it here and there in different organized data engineering organizations, but we wanted to build it into the tool. And then for the data as a first class citizen, I think there are some tools out there that might might treat data that way, but for some of the uh, tools like Airflow, I think they do a great job of being a general workflow orchestrator, can do anything. We don't mm -hmm. try to do everything. If it does has nothing to do with data, you know, no, Mage is probably not the tool for that. So we really focus on that. And that way we can build in, if we treat data as a first guess and everything you do in Mage has, is around data, then Every, all the features that we build, they really work well with data and we can build them into the foundation of it, of the, of the tool and not have to worry, hey, will this feature be applicable to things that aren't data? Mm. Well, yeah. It, also, I had that feeling whenever I, when I worked with it, it's like everything's working around the data there's yes. there are, it's not overblown with features it's just what you need to work with the data yes, uh, so, yes. yeah I, I, I can see that uh, there's a question uh love the energy tommy question <laughs> does mage have a concept of executors or workers like airflow um does the mage instance execute the code itself or is uh, separated somehow yes great question it does have a concept of I would say executors workers. So we designed Mage to run optimally in containers. And so yes, when you use it locally, you can run it in a in your Docker container. You can install via pip, conda, poetry. But when you deploy it to cloud using our Terraform templates, let's say you want to deploy it to ECS. So it's AWS's container service or, or even EKS. You can configure Mage so that when it needs to run a pipeline, each pipeline will run its own pod or container. And so that's like the concept of workers. So we, mm -hmm. you know, Docker containers, containerized runs is, is built in into Mage. So yeah. next part is, does the Mage instance? Yes, it does. The So when that container spins up and you can configure at a project level, four CPU, eight gigabytes of RAM. You can also configure different pipelines that have different resources. Maybe one pipeline just needs to do a lot of image downloading and use a lot of memory. So maybe you bump that one to 16. So it'll spin up uh, its own container, run it, and then tear that down. So it does execute the code uh, on that machine. Now, let's say you have terabytes of data, or you have a ton of data that's already in Snowflake, one of your data warehouses, you don't need to move that data into, into the container that's running Mage. Just use a SQL block. I shared before, you can mix and match Python SQL. Just write SQL and then execute your transformation, directly leverage your data warehouse's compute. Or you have terabytes of data, you, we recommend using something like Spark. Uh, you can connect to EMR, you can connect to Databricks, et cetera, and just execute the PySpark code you write in Mage on those Spark clusters. But have it all scheduled or, or orchestrated in within Mage, like, right? That's the, yep. 
yeah. that's what I see is the big upside with this. You can directly code in it, but you can handle very different pipelines within that one within yes. that one tool. Yes. Um, yeah. And there, there's another question. I'm not sure if that is too detailed. Uh, can Mage move my SQL point data type in a readable format? I don't know. Let me see. <laughs> Let me know. Can, uh, maybe, maybe you could uh, rephrase that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm also not 100% sure what that means. So let's maybe Amar rephrase that. Um, JR, uh, questions? directly in the chat <laughs> that's what we're doing here <laughs> put them directly in the chat um yeah so now we know how mage how mage started it, basically you you came from the airflow direction you figured out okay these are problems that we <laughs> that we have with this um yeah with the one thing that people haven't asked is, is that free? Is that open source? How, how does that, how do you distribute that? Yes, absolutely. So we're, we're a venture back company. We have a you know, good sized team and we are just focusing on making this tool easier and easier for developers to use and adding more features into the open source project. So it is absolutely free. It, was, it will always be free in 12 uh in around 12 18 months we'll have a cloud hosted version where you know if if you don't want to self-host and we'll continue to making it easy and easier to self-host we'll have we'll have a, a cloud version that will have some collaboration or community features in there that will add lots of value and uh, will potentially monetize from those types of collaboration or community features yeah so it's basically like Spark slash Databricks, you have the version that you can run your own. But if, you, if you're lazy, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I would be, <laughs> then I would get, just get the cloud version. Yes, and, and yes, except, it, except we're going to be, or we are magnitudes easier to run than running your own Spark. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and funny enough, that was actually the question um, that JR wanted to ask. Is this an open source tool? Do we need to uh, get a subscription server for enterprise use? So basically, no, there is no subscription for enterprise use. Mm -hmm. You go out there, you use it. Yep. Um, there's something about binary data. To norm Can you work with binary data? Because sometimes that's as, important, right? As long as the data can be serialized and deserialized, uh, then yes, and and you'll see, Mage, you write the code, you write, you tell Mage like what to do, so it can theoretically, technically work with any anything. It, it's just you write your own code. So it, as you'll see, it might look like a no code, low code tool, but you still write the code in your pipeline at the end of the day. So if you need it to, if you need to, you know, parse it and then be able to read serialize binary data in your own in your own custom way. We're not stopping you from that. You just write the code to do that and it'll work. I'm actually oops, I'm actually happy about that because I'm not the big no code or low code guy. I know this it's nice, but at some point you need to do something that it's not supported and then you yeah. start from the beginning again. So I I think that's a very clever move to be able to do the actual coding and, and not have like these standard things. Um, maybe we should talk uh, two, three uh, th sentences about Spark again, because uh, you already mentioned it, but Alexander is asking this again. What's the best way to use Spark and Mage together, batch or streaming? I think. Yeah. Great what question. Great question. Answer? So Spark streaming is, in the streaming pipelines is it's not supported quite yet it's on the near-term roadmap so right now you'd if you wanted to use spark you'd, you'd create the batch pipelines you would choose the pi spark in this drop down you can choose okay i want to use pi spark and then you in your python blocks you can you have access to the spark session and then you can write your use the spark syntax and then operate on the 
you know, the data frames there. And then when Mage runs, it will execute that code on your remote local Spark cluster. Yeah. So, Alexander, I hope this helps. Um, there is one, uh, do we need to start with Mage right away or with Airflow first? Like, do you need Airflow knowledge to start with Mage? No, absolutely not. Now, one thing is, let's say, let's say you had a car and, or let's say uh, immediately you go drive a Ferrari Lamborghini. That's your first car. Then you, you won't know what a, what some other cars, a diesel car that has some, you know, small wheels, stick shift, you know, zero to 60 in 10 seconds. Well, you know, you don't know what that, that'll be like. So if you then, you know, you start out with this car, that car that I just mentioned, and then you go to a Ferrari then you'll, you'll realize, okay, wow, that's what the, that's the difference. That's what we're solving. So to answer mm -hmm. your question, you, know, you could definitely start off with airflow, spend 10 X the time to get up and running. And then you'll be like, oh, I need something better. I need something faster, easier. And then use mage or you can save that headache, save that suffering and just start off with mage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, from from my point of view, having created a course on Airflow, the setup, although you're running this in, in the Dockerized environment, can be super annoying. And like, what it was exactly how I shown it in the video. It was just okay. You do one that one Docker command where you pull the image and then start the container, and that's it. Then you can already start. And it's, it's it's a lot easier. So you you would not most likely not go the other way around. <laughs> um, what's that? Another key concept to highlight? Maybe all the data in Mage exists in a data frame once ingested. So when we initially we we added support for Pandas data frame just because it's super simple to easy to use. However each block doesn't need to return that. So, it, and, and we'll go through it eventually, but in your code, you can return anything that's just JSON serializable. And because we'll eventually serialize it to disk and then you know deserialize it to, uh, for the downstream blocks. So by default, yes, you know, we do have pandas data frames throughout the code, but that's just to make things really, really easy. But you could graduate from that and then use your own. We recently added integration with Polars as well. Uh, you can use those data frames or just dictionaries, lists, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I like I have I have a question not directly um, to that topic, but like, what do you think are the from your point of view the main problems that people struggle with not just with airflow but building data pipelines like wh what's the what's the typical thing that that you see where, where it, or let's let's keep it with beginners that beginners are usually struggle with where a beginner might be a lot better off with mage that i think that's that's an interesting i think i think the infrastructure piece is is always a big one what we you know we focus on data engineering but our mission is to make data engineering more accessible not just for you know for data engineering but also accessible to software engineers to data analysts to data scientists etc analytics engineers and we are starting to see a lot of these folks who aren't data engineering focused or heavy or infra heavy be able to stand up their their infrastructure their pipelining their scheduling with mage so we see us helping a lot overcoming the those hurdles just getting something in production that actually that, that's that's the main thing productionizing your code in a repeatable observable way that's the hardest part going from mm -hmm. my laptop to something in the cloud running consistently without failing or at least in a way that i'm alerted even when it fails yeah, that's actually, a, that's a good point. And it, that that mixes with 
I, th I think data scientists and analysts are also more working towards the engineering, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it, it's not as it used to that the scientist is just doing the, the science behind it and has nothing to do with the data pipelines and so on. And it makes it more accessible for yes. them if they, yep. that, with the learning curve that I mentioned earlier, you don't have yep. that steep learning curve. Um, I actually, here's a, here's a question. I actually haven't thought about this before, <laughs> but that's actually a good thing. How do you like protect the data or the code in, in that, in mage? Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll answer the code and then the data. So let's say you're running mage in production. Let's just take e, AWS. It will read from the its local file storage, so Elastic File System. You can either build your own Docker image using Mage as the base, and then packaging your code, your project code in that in that Docker image, or you're running an application of Mage can sync your code from anything that uses Git. And then it can pull that, pull the main branch, latest branch, whatever, down to that local file system. And so Mage is constantly running, constantly reading that code. How do you protect it? Make sure no one has access to GitLab, GitHub, or make sure no one can access the file system that the uh, Mage is running on. So that's the code. But for the data, so let's assume the data, you're ingesting data from different places, like outside your database, your data warehouse. By default, Mage will write the data to disk. That's how it passes the data around. So let's say you have a block of code. It just outputs you know, a, a list of 100 dictionaries. OK, while that pipeline's running, that list of dictionaries is serialized to disk part in parquet format. And what that disk, you know, that's the file system, elastic file system. That's by default. You can event, you can have it write to S3 if you want. So when you, if you if you use the default way, how do you protect that? What people do is well, one, don't let anyone access your file system, but also you can have a recurring task that cleans all that up as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. It always starts with a with a level one that you think. Don't let people on the on the servers. Don't let yes. people have access to the to the base uh, system. Oh, actually, now that you mentioned different levels, yes, that is that level. The other level is so there's there's don't let ac people access that. Of course, there's the network setting, so you, you do VPN, security groups, etc. And then there's a the top layer where you can run mage and enable user authentication. So then you have role-based access. You can create users that can only view, create users that can edit and view, and then create users that can create users and edit and view. Yeah. So there's there's that layer as well. Okay, well, that's that's very important to have that. I actually haven't seen that in the demo that I recorded. Uh, so. uh, I'll show it. I'll, I'll show it. Okay, uh, okay, okay cool, time. cool. Um, I know if, if we want, we can we can walk towards the hands on part. Yeah, because we we talked a lot about what what can it do? What uh, what connections can you make with outside systems ETL ELT? Um, let, let's let's give people a, a overview um, of the first you know, the first parts of the of this workshop. Yes, let's do this. And then as I go through it, folks, please ask questions, jump out. Uh, let's make this interactive. Let's, let's make it fun. There's going to be four parts to to this demo. Part one, well, I want to show you the data integration pipeline, how to build something that just seeks data. And then I want to show you how to build a batch standard pipeline, You know the things that you normally see, write code, do this, do this, do this. Then I want to show you some testing how to write some test validations and I'll show you the observability piece. Okay, let's jump into it. Yeah. So first, uh, what you see here, I'm running this locally in a Docker container. This is reading a bunch of files from my local file system. These are all my pipelines. I'm going to go ahead and create a data integration pipeline. So over here, it's, it's loading some sources underneath the hood. 
we actually use Singer. We use the Singer spec. For those that are, aren't familiar with what that is, Stitch came out with this in 2018. And it's just a, a way to a guide on how to do uh, data integrations, how to pull data from a place, the schema it should adhere to, et cetera. And so there's, there's, it's really awesome because there's over 300 community developed what they call taps and targets out there. So we have access to quite a few of them. Okay, so you, I don't, you can't see this drop down. It's, it's a big drop down, but I'm going to just choose Postgres. Okay, so I'm gonna name this. I'm gonna name this Postgres test source. Awesome, let's save this block. Actually, I'm just gonna hide this left side since we don't need it. Okay, so data integration is just syncing from a source and then sending it to a destination. Great, I have my source here. I'm going to uh, paste in some credentials real quick. Awesome. I can test my connection from here. Great. Now let's look at all the tables I can sync. All right, awesome. I got some good tables here. Maybe I want to sync this. Maybe I want to sync uh, this one here. Confirm. And then we're going to talk about CDC as well. So here I can configure these. I can say, you know, users, user with emails, account v1 okay so there's a few ways you can copy data sync data from postgres or similar sources you can do full table and what that will do is on every sync it'll just loop through the entire table you can do incremental so let's say okay pretend i want to do incremental and there is a system mod stamp i'll check this out so what will happen is let's say today it will sync a thousand accounts. And then tomorrow when it runs, it will pick up from the last place it left off on. So the last place would be the system modify stamp. So let's say I updated a user and the updated date is today. It will pick up from the last one that it left off on. So it doesn't have to go through your entire table. And then mm -hmm. finally, you could actually do log-based replication. So this is where you know, Postgres, and it depends on your database. Postgres has its write ahead logs. Every uh, mutation, transaction, it will, it will have a record for that. And then Mage will just read from that and then op uh, perform that operation. Okay. Oh, last thing Wait, I want so, to know is yep, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, because that was actually, that's interesting because that was actually a question on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, under the video like, how does Mage handle change data capture? Yeah, nice. And so basically, as I understand this, whenever you ha if you have a column that has a timestamp and that basically shows you when was this changed, it's it's fairly simple to to integrate it. Yep, yep, and that'd be the incremental, the incremental one. It's even the it's it's easy it's even easier for the log base because uh let's say you make any edits, any deletes, any uh, schema changes, etc there will be a, a bunch of logs that Postgres writes to and Mage will just read from those and then perform that same operation on mm -hmm. the destination that in this pipeline. Yeah. So here Michael asks, so is that built in CDC on a Mage data integration? Yes. Yes, that is. Right. Yep. And then cool. another really cool thing I want to show is this unique conflict method. So let's say I, I want to make this column ID unique, right? Uh, one row for every single user. When I sync it, let's say I do full table every single day. When I sync it, if I see uh, the same exact row with that same exact ID, I can either ignore it or I can have Mage take all the, take the columns values from the new row that matches the same duplicate ID and then just update the existing record. Cool. cool. Okay. If you do that though, then you might, so with updates, you might going to do updates if even if it's not necessary, right? Yes. So you, you need to think about that. What do you want? Can you afford to do that or? Yep. Not? One thing, uh, of course, everybody has their own uh, their their own needs, but data is cheap. So, 
we usually just every day, if you're running daily jobs, just copy if you can, depending on your infrastructure, but just copy the entire table and partition it. That way you have a snapshot of the data at every day and you can do, it's just, it just makes life easier. I, I found that a lot easier. Okay, so let's go ahead to the destination. Okay, so, you know, you again, there's S3, BigQuery, Delta Lake, you know, uh, Cloud Storage, SQL Server, et cetera, Redshift, Snowflake, Trino. There's a bunch, but I just want to show you, I'm just gonna do Postgres again, just because it's, uh, it's, it's fast and local. So here, you just fill in the credentials and the, this configuration changes depending on uh, wherever you, uh, whatever source you're using. So I'm just going to paste in some more credentials here. Oh, one thing I didn't share is, okay, pretend this password was something ultra secret. And, you know, you, you don't want to write it in your code. Actually, you should not. When you, everything you write in here is going to be in a file that you're going to commit. You, you definitely don't want to do that. You can do things like this. You can uh, interpolate the environment variables like this. So you can do this, you know, some super secret password that's one way another way is every cloud provider has its own secret manager and we integrate with all of them so then you can leverage that secret manager and then just interpolate the secret here and then the mm -hmm. third way is i can create secrets here so maybe i do something like pgpw it's cool so now i can do something like this and so you could do you just store the secrets here in mage like this pgpw just like that mm. and then that's basically encrypted and yep. stored on uh, on your mage instance yep yep okay so that's, so I, that's pretty simple we need to actually put in the real one <laughs> okay let's go test connection great awesome so now just like that you know this this is actually the the low code part of, of mage i can sync two tables you know, these two tables here, if we go down here, these two tables to this Postgres. Now I can be done, go ahead and run it. Or let's say we want to throw in the T, right? The E, the T, the L. You can optionally put in some Python code here. So this is going to be a row by row transformation. So let's say it's like row like that. And it's going to be in the, going to be a, single row pandas data frame so you can do things like uh maybe you had a social security number on there and you want to obfuscate it or maybe you have some computed column that you want to do some calculation on right like one times one or maybe you want to import a library that does something some forecasting you can do that here you can clean the data here as well if you want again also you know you could clean the data afterwards in a different pipeline uh at a at a batch in a batch but if you want to just do it on the fly you can do that here okay so that is the data integration piece pretty straightforward i'm gonna uh, the next part I, I could show you how to trigger it run it but I'm, I'm gonna save that for after the batch pipeline are you going to show on the right uh, a bit about the tree how you can modify that uh, that uh the tree Yes, that I was going to show that in the standard batch pipeline okay. because in the data integration, it's just you know quite straightforward. It's, it's straightforward. Yeah. Yep, yep. Cool. Very okay. Cool. If no one has questions, I can Michael said uh, there needs to be a whole knowledge article on a different replication <laughs> feature. Do you yes. have Do you have that like a a a, um, a knowledge base for Mage or I don't I don't, I don't like we, a big documentation we do, but part. that's a. Uh, uh, we can make it easier to find. So uh, we, we do have that. Let me, I can pull that up. But we do have a, a page that shows the different replications for different s destinations and sources. So I'll, I'll share that with you after, Michael. Thank you for calling that out. Uh, Eka was Eka was showing, say, uh, saying here, hmm, Python might be a problem for data citizens. I think she's alluding towards SQL. Oh, no so problem. You, you, yeah, you could have done everything with Python here, just with with SQL, right? Yes, yes. So actually, the data integration piece. Let, if we want to just remove the transformer, there's there's 
there's no language at all. You just write in a bunch of, you know, credentials. I will, let me just jump into the yeah. data integration. I mean, the standard batch pipeline piece. And then, you know, I'll show you how to use SQL blocks as well for those uh, data citizens. Awesome. Okay, so here we're going to jump into the standard batch pipeline. Okay, so I, I showed before, there's a bunch of, you know, this is a file structure. When you start Mage, you can name it whatever project you want. The default is default repo, and it will create a few folders for you. And underneath these folders, you can actually create as many folders as you want. Right? This is just the standard scaffolding. I, I showed before, you can reuse a lot of code. So I'm going to just drag and drop this right here. Actually, let me show you what it looks like to just add data first. So here you can choose R SQL Python. I'm going to show you Python, then I'll, then I'll show you SQL. And I remember we hinted to the templates. There's just a bunch of templates here. And then you can either use Mage provided templates or you can even add your own templates to use for your team. So here I'm going to just choose API. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to fetch data from API. And it's just a bunch of boilerplate. If we remove a lot of the you know comments, remove the test, remove this statement right here, this is basically all it is. Okay, I'm gonna paste in just this URL real quick. What is this doing? It's just fetching a CSV file, parsing it. Okay, now I'm going to click this play button and run it. And this is where you get the interactive piece. I, I can, of course, this is a pretty simple code, but if you had 100 lines and you're doing some really complex logic, you want to be able to run it and test it here and see is it producing the results that you're looking for. Beyond that, so let's say I was able to load some data. You could do some really other cool things. You can use some charts. So I have, let's see, I have, okay, so some restaurant data. Maybe let's let's look at the columns real quick. I'm just gonna hide my left side. Okay, I have a column for rating. So this is restaurant data. You, every user has a transaction, when they paid, what restaurant they ate at, the cuisine, how much money was made, the ambiance, like the rating they gave, you know, was it good, was it bad? Let's go ahead and look at the distribution for that. We can, for this charts drop down. you can choose from a few pre-created charts. I'm gonna choose a histogram. Okay, histogram, I'm going to choose rating, and I'm going to click this play button right here. And just like that, I can see the distribution. So it seems like not a lot of people give fours. Oh, cool. People are very nice. They give fives and they give threes. Another thing I could do is also we see cuisine right here. Let's look at the breakdown of cuisines. Like maybe everybody eats tapas or steakhouses. Let's, let's see if it's distributed properly. So we can click pie chart. Uh, let's change this to cuisine. Awesome. So it's just pretty evenly balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a good data set here. And then finally, another thing we could do is we can look at yeah, some of these are templates. So you, could, you don't have to configure it. You can just click it. And these are called feature profiles. So no missing values, no missing values, and the number of unique values, et cetera. Cool. So well, the that's more, that's already more towards the observability part yep. right? that you, yes, that you can exactly. see the statistics about the data. Yes. Uh, also, look, if we do, let's say I load 100 and run this, uh, when you run, rerun your block and change anything in it, these also will rerun and refresh. As you can see, mm -hmm. the numbers drop there. So really cool. And yeah, the, the charts are for, for you to be able to visualize your data. Everything's about data. I mentioned before, everything's, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to tell, oh, did my code produce the data? Well, yeah, it produced the data, but did it produce it correctly? And, you know, visualizing it can help and be like, oh, but imagine if there's, there's just all fives. Well, maybe you accidentally filtered out everything else. So the charts really help with that. Okay. Yeah. So that was the Python block of code. Uh, Let's go to. Can, can we go? Can we go through two, three, two, three questions? Of course, let's do it. I wanted to. Do, uh, I wanted to go through the questions. I, I saw that, but I wasn't sure if we should, could or not. Yeah, the, because the one we we were talking about the the variables. I think that's very important, where you define the the secret variables. Like how is how does that work with teams? 
here. Yes. Uh, can everyone in the team see the environment variables? For example, in prod, if prod credentials are saved in environment variable, can users be blocked from seeing that? Yes. So remember the, the layer one is, or the, the top layer is a user authentication. So let's say you don't want certain people to even access mage. Don't give them an account or you don't want them to edit. Don't make them an editor, just make them a viewer. So that's one. The second way is let's say there are viewers. How do you prevent them from looking at the printing out the environment variables? We actually, in Mage, we do this automatically. Everywhere that has an output statement, like a print in logs, anything like that, the environment variables are obfuscated. So that will prevent them from seeing the raw value of that. Okay. Cool. Um, and Andy was asking, because we've see, we are seeing here on the top CPU 0.4% memory, 336, no, 63 megabytes. Like how large of a VM uh, do you need to self-host? Yep. So we, the, in the, our Terraform templates, we put it at 512 megabyte RAM and 0 0.5 CPU. It really depends on your workload, but you can go that low. You, you can go that low. And if you are pulling in a bunch of data, uh, let's say you're pulling in like a gigabyte of data and you want to operate on it all in memory, well, then you'll, you'll need to increase your memory there. And then if, if for CPU, if you want to run, you know, if you don't want to use the, the Docker containers and you just want to run it all on one machine, well, then if you want to be able to operate faster, more computations, you might want to increase the CPU, but you can get away with uh, pretty low 0 0.5 CPU and then uh, 512 megabyte RAM. So it's very good for, for starting out. <laughs> yep. Yep. You, you can save money in the beginning. Um, uh, we already talked about that better performance. Is it possible to parallelize any of the ETL steps in mage? Yes, we were there is. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So let me sh add another step here and I'll, I'll just call it SQL block right here. So if the steps, these are block steps, if they don't, if they don't have an upstream or their upstream is done and they're not waiting on anything else, they will all run concurrently. So that's how you can parallelize your, these, the blocks in your pipeline. Now, if you want to parallel or run your pipelines concurrently, that's already done. That you can set a max concurrency, but by default, they'll just run concurrently for you. Very cool. All right, you want to show the yes. Let's let's move to the next one. <laughs> awesome. So here is a SQL block, and we can just write raw SQL. So in this drop down, I don't know if you can see this drop down. We connect to you know. BigQuery, ClickHouse, Druid, a bunch of things. So remember that we just created a data integration pipeline that you know sends data to our analytics Postgres. So we'll just go ahead and connect to that one. I have a bunch of profiles uh, with credentials already. So this is it's stored in a file down here. So I just chose this profile default. And then let's say, let's just type in select star from, I think it was, uh, let me see, what was the, okay, it's, it's right here, cool. So select star from mage analytics user with US. I think, yep, that was the table that we stored it in, okay? So let's just run this and let's see what happens. Okay, so let's see, uh-huh. Oh, it, it doesn't exist. I wonder what I named it. Oh, because I didn't run it yet, okay. Sorry, folks, we have to go and run that integration pipeline. Was it right here? Yes. Okay. Nope, nope. It wasn't that one. It was this one. Okay. Let's go ahead and run this real quick. I need that data to sync to uh, to run that data. Actually, let's just, okay, so you can see it run like this. Uh, the account was done. Oh, this one. Okay. Let's uh, take a look at the logs. Is good observability. Great, great, yeah, great. Very good, very good. I like it. Oh, I see. I can't see. Okay. Got it. Cool, cool. Okay. Let me go ahead and uh, fix that real quick. 
Let's see which one was that. Okay. Nope, not that one. Uh, okay, let's just do this one. All right. Let's go ahead and see this one. Engineers. Oh, yep. It's, oh, that one's running. Huh. Interesting. Okay. My database is. Let me let me just check to see if my Postgres is running or not. Um, let me see. Logs here. Oh, okay. I have to drop that table one second. Moment. But it's it's a good good thing to see here how easy it is to actually figure out what's what's wrong. Right? Yes. You see, yep, yep. okay, it, it's failing immediately. You see that. And you go into the logs here and you can figure out what's what's happening very yep. easily. Let's go ahead and retry this run. And go here. Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, great. It's done. It's like it's awesome cool. debugging, real time debugging. Okay, let's go back to <laughs> was it this one that we're doing? Nope, it was this one. I should I should be giving these better names. Okay, let's give these better names. Okay, so uh, data plumbing without the poop. Cool. Now we know this is the pipeline. All right, now let's go back to edit pipeline, and then uh, let me zoom in a little bit. I didn't want to make it too big. Okay, so now we can run this, and look, we just fetched data from the uh, the schema from that data integration pipeline. Awesome. So now let's go ahead and uh, let's have this right to me. Analytics staging. Great. Okay. Let's also use some charts to take a look at this data because we want to see the shape of it. Okay. So then let's do, there's a, okay. This is a table that contains a bunch of users, uh, emails that they received, maybe some sort of marketing email, like restaurant marketing email, whether they unsubscribe or not, when it was delivered, uh, also, some information about the user when they join, their age, gender, country, where you know, just a bunch of cool data. Mm. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at. Okay, let's see delivered at. We want to see. There's a date on here called delivered at. So we want to look at. Okay, over the years, how many emails were sent? So we'll choose a time series line chart. Cool. So down here. Uh, let's, is it, is it this one? Oh, it's this one. Okay. So the time column we said would be delivered at, uh, you can even change the interval. So let's say you had data for a single day and you just wanted to see how many, uh, the hours and by hour, how many were sent. You can change this to hour, but I'm choosing years just because this spans, I think decades. Oh, and you can choose the aggregation. So, of course, this is going to do a group by delivered at. So, we want to just count uh, the ID email. Cool. So, here you go. We can see we sent a lot of emails in 1974. And then over time, we just slowly sent less and less. Maybe because people unsubscribed from our non-targeted emails. And that we're going to fix that with more targeted emails. Cool. So, that's, that's the line chart. Uh, another thing we can take a look at also is... So we send emails, right? And people unsubscribe. Let's take a look at how many people did actually unsubscribe. So we'll do a pie chart. And let's do the column for unsubscribed. Press play. Cool. Oh, cool. Not too many people unsubscribe. Nice. Okay, well, we'll keep up the emails then. Okay, so that's how you can use both Python and SQL uh, together. Now I'm gonna nice. go step further, and let's start, you know, cleaning the data. Let's uh, transform it, etc. Okay, so for columns, by cleaning, we saw that there weren't any missing data. But what I usually like to do is I like to clean up these column names. So I'm gonna add a step in here. And I'm gonna say, clean a bunch of column names. Awesome. Oh, by the way. I shared before every step in your pipeline is its own individual file. So if you see here, clean a bunch of column names, this is clean a bunch of column names right there. Mm -hmm. I could actually reuse something here as well. Maybe I'll, I will actually reuse one of those. Okay, so let's go ahead and clean some column names. So here I'm going to, so you see here, it, get, it hints to you. 
the the first positional argument is coming from this block fetch data from API. If I so you see this, I just clicked on this. I can drag this and then drop it on this. And now this will have two positional arguments. And I can even you know move this down here if I want, like that. So this will have two positional arguments. So I can do like data two. And we know that data two comes from this block called open no. flower, just like that. And you might wonder, actually, this is a good time to talk about this. Where is all this configuration stored? Where are the three blocks stored? How is the dependency logic stored? It's actually stored in this metadata YAML file. So this is called data plumbing, right? Okay, so here, check this out. So this is the metadata YAML file. Um, actually, let me save this real quick. Let me see, is that the one? Or, okay, so here, it has this array called blocks. It has a UEID example name, et cetera. And then each of the blocks has a reference to its upstream and downstream. And the reason why we did that was so that you wouldn't have to write in the uh, the dependency logic here. Imagine if you had to do like add task, task one like this. You're not going to be able to reuse this because you're encoding the dependencies within the execution logic itself. It makes it quite difficult to reuse. And so we separate that, making it easier, more modular, and easier to test, which I'll show later as well. Okay, mm. let's get back to this one. There was, there was one thing, Tommy, before we, before we move on. Yep. Um, there was a, like a quick discussion. Um, Eka was asking here, how is, uh, how is it different from Fivetran? Yes. Um, Okay, okay. Michael okay. Michael said the, the visualization results are <laughs> really different here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, Michael's spot on. Well, a few things. I would say Fivetran, you know, data engineers, they use it just because somebody in marketing or somewhere else asked them to, but it's not really a data engineering tool. And mm -hmm. yes, it can replicate data for you and it does it really great. And I would say, you know, their connectors might be uh, good. It might, they have a hundred or so connectors, but what Mage does is we leverage the open source connectors that others have built and uh, called taps, called targets that Singer, that Singer came up with, but others have implemented. And there's about 300 plus out there and we add them all in here and we support them. And when it's all in one tool, because when we talk about data pipelines, we think of them, we think of data integration pipelines, transformation pipelines as all data pipelines. So we make it so that you can build both of them in here and you can combine them, orchestrate them, have them talk to each other, which is, which I'll, I'll show you how you can have, actually have one trigger the other after it's done, et cetera. And in addition, if you really need, you can customize the source or the destination underneath the hood. Everything's written in Python. Everything's a single file. In addition, you can add custom, uh, I sh let me see, this data integration pipeline. You can add a step in between, which I think is super helpful, to transform the data on the fly as well if you really need to. So that's another really great part. And also, Fivetran is uh, notoriously very, very expensive. So if you just have a ton of money to spend, you know, Five trend might be a good one. I, 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 I also agree to uh, Michael here, <laughs> I, I, because when I do debugging, so how yes. do I debug? Usually, now, or very often, you don't know the exact position where something goes wrong, or. Yep. Yes, it fails at some stage, but most likely it's going to fail because somewhere earlier in the pipeline, something failed. And that's why I like these integrated visualizations here. First of all, again, I'm a visual guy. I, need, I like to see <laughs> visualizations and, and actually see the data. And this way, it's super easy to actually figure out, okay, is my data still... It, logically, does that make sense? Or is that completely nothing here that makes yep. no sense right yeah and um, i think that is something that re is really really helping and this is missing in a lot of tools to have that directly integrated and you as a developer especially if somebody pre-built this right 
yep. th through the development, maybe. Can you actually add comments here as well? Oh, yes, you can. Let me see. Uh, okay, blocks, yes. So I can say, yeah, don't change my code. Ta-da! <laughs> Okay, <laughs> yeah, because then you know the, you know, this is, you could write here, okay, this needs to be the outcome of this for the next person who's working on it. Yep. And you can easily check it through the, through the, the data that is previewed or through the charts. Yes, so yes. I, I, I think that's, that's really cool. And then speaking of uh, the part about like how the data should be in the, in the next phase and the next step of the workshop i want to show you how we can build in you know data validations or data quality checks using libraries like create expectations so that's mm -hmm. going to be fun too yeah i i think i i uh interrupted you you wanted to do something oh no worries no no this is great this is great i'm just going through this uh i'm adding a, a step to clean the data right so just like that um, it's going to clean the data let's see Uh, I added too many, too many uh, positional arguments. Cool. Yeah, because so, we find it. Awesome. I cleaned my data. I have, and of course, this is a contrived example, but I was just cleaning up the column names. In real life, you probably want to fill in missing values or uh, do something like that. Okay. So then the next step I want to do in this is let's do some aggregation. So if we look back at this, Oh, here, we can expand this a bit too. So if you look at this restaurant data, every row is a meal, it belongs to a user, et cetera. Let's do some transformations that will give us the number of meals per user and the average revenue per user. Let's see who's a big spender. Okay, so let's go ahead and add a block here. So we'll add transformer and let's. we're just gonna switch between SQL and my uh, and Python. Well, this is a good opportunity to reuse some code, actually. So here I have some. Which which languages can you add here? We we right. we saw saw a quick preview like. Right now you can do R Python, SQL, R. Uh, on the roadmap, people have been asking for things like TypeScript, uh, Rust, Scala. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think Scala is the big one that's next. But yes, uh, these okay. are the ones currently. Okay. Cool. Let me go ahead and actually reuse this. So you just drag and drop this here like that. And then I can, uh, uh, oh, that's not the one. Delete that. Okay, I think, which one is it? It might be this one. Okay, nice. So here I'm going to drag this like this. So now I'm telling it to, hey, run this, then pass this data down to here. Okay, so I'm going to choose... I need to execute this somewhere. So I'm just going to execute it on my Postgres. Choose the default one. Uh, mage, uh, I'm telling it where what schema I want to save it to. So I can call it temp. All right. So then let's just replace and let's run this. So what it's doing is it's doing, uh, oh, actually, I wrote that wrong. User ID like that. Uh, user ID. And then I can run this. Awesome. So I just got. A one row per user and then the number of meals. So look at this. This person ate 12 times. I can now also add average revenue. We want to create a lot of attributes here. Cool. Average revenue. And again, you know, we can take a look at this data. Let's look at uh, a histogram of, let's see, number of meals. Let's see who eats. Ooh, okay. Look, most people. This is follows a normal distribution. Mm, this data is nice. This data is actually too nice. <laughs> okay, let's look at the <laughs> uh, same thing. We can take a look at the histogram. This is a good way to just do sanity check on the data. Like, did I uh, miss something? Okay, revenue. Okay, normal distribution. Awesome. Great. This this data is amazing. Okay, so let's see the. The last thing we want to do is maybe combine all of this together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and we want to actually let's name this a little better. This is user with emails. Our pipeline looks a little nicer, or else we won't know what all this does. 
Okay, so then let's do this one is add columns. Oh, whoopsie. I think I actually just deleted my block of code. What was that? Little voice, right? Yep. Okay, let's do that here and let's rename this here. Okay. All right. Let's call this add columns. Oh, oh I keep accidentally deleting it. Sorry about that. Uh, let me put that back. Oops. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's do. Oh, let me do that again. Yes. Okay. Got it. All right. So, let me make sure this runs. Okay. Oh, I didn't choose that. Okay. All right, okay, let's go ahead and now create another block that combines it all. And I sometimes some of these blocks could be combined, but I just wanted to you know show how we can make each step one by one by one. And by by splitting a lot of the logic up, you increase the chances of it being able to be reused. So let's see, I'm gonna do use some Python real quick. Let's say combine data. Okay, then I'm going to drag this here, go down here. Okay, so in here, it's just what? It's one. Actually, I need to do, I need to do these. I need to do this one too. Because this one will have the original restaurant data. This one will have uh, the two new columns. And then this one will have all the user information. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and then we get this little helper right here. So the little voice is okay that's the combined one so we'll want to do data two on data oh this might work let's just see okay now <laughs> uh, data two i think i have to switch this Awesome. Okay, so this is some um, panda specific syntax, but all I'm doing is I'm joining it. I could have used SQL to join it as well, but I wanted to alternate between SQL blocks and Python blocks. So all this is doing is, is taking uh, the user with emails. Well, first is taking the restaurant data, combining it with the computed columns that we created, the aggregated uh, values, and then combining with user information. Okay, so now that I combined it, what are we going to do with it? Uh, let's send it over to Snowflake so other people can use it. So then we can do data exporter. Again, you can use the, we can use, we can actually use a SQL block to export it as well, or we can use Python. Maybe you want to do something unique in Python code that you just can't do in SQL. Well, we provide templates for that as well. So we'll do this, and then I will paste in. Uh, Again, this is a bunch of boilerplate. Let's do table name, uh, some cool data. Awesome. And then we just run this. I have my credentials stored in this file. That's why it's reading from that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's done. But let's not take my word for it. Let's, uh, let's check the data. Uh, let's see. We can add a scratch pad. Oh, here's another really cool thing is, let's say you're building out these blocks, right? So every time you add a block, it appears. But what if you want to just write some code, test it to see if it works without messing up or overriding any of your existing blocks? Mm. Yeah, it's something what we call a scratch pad. It's literally a scratch pad. You can just write anything in it like this. Plus one plus one, right? Print okay. hello, you know, just like that. Cool. So let me just uh, copy some of this data real quick. Okay, so, so we can do, I think it's called load. Um, let me see if this is, it's going to be the syntax. It's, it's not the syntax. Uh, here, maybe it'll be easier just to use a SQL block. Okay, let's just uh, do a SQL block real quick. Uh, cool. We'll do Snowflake profile. Use all select from is it?
Um, maybe it's. Oh, I think. Let me let me check my configuration file to see if I did that correctly. Uh, By the way, everybody, my typical error would have been that I would have had auto suspend on my warehouse and by now I would get an error that my warehouse is suspended. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let me check. Okay, maybe I need, I need to check uh, I might not have authorization to read from it. Okay, we can get back to this. I have to, maybe, I think I don't have permission. My user doesn't have read permissions. Hmm, interesting. Okay, well, Could be. yep, we can check. We'll check that one later. We'll come back to that. For now, we just built out, you know, just to summarize, low data, clean, uh, do some transformations, combine, and then export. Now, mm -hmm. what I want to show next is the the validations before we get into the scheduling. So what's really great, there's two ways you can test your code. You can write tests alongside your code, just like this. So you just add test like this. And I can do, let's say, test number of rows. So the first positional argument would just be the data that it returns. And do this. And then we can write anything we want in here. Typically, I just write a cert. Let's do the length of the data. That, what is it? It's a 10,000. I'm going to make it fail, okay, just to show you. So let's do 11,000. Every single, so once you write, we can actually do multiple of these. Let me just do test number of columns. And then the columns, let's see, how many columns are there? There's 10, so I'll just do 10. Yeah. And it'll be uh, and the error message, not enough columns, not enough, not enough rows. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then every single time I run this or anybody on my team runs this, uh, let's say they're building out their own pipeline and then they're including this block of code, reusing this block of code, and they wanted to change something about it and they run it, they'll see that all the tests get ran every single time you run this block of code, and it'll tell you which one has failed. So it says not enough rows. In addition, when you run this pipeline end to end, you know, via schedule, via trigger, every single time this step or this block runs, it will also run these tests and it will fail the pipeline. It'll raise a, an exception. It'll tell you why it failed and you'll get alerted. So that's a really cool way to ensure that your, your code is running uh, properly and nothing's breaking it. So I'm gonna yeah, fix so it. So if you write this correctly, you don't have the the danger of something changes in the source or they have some kind of problems and then you actually don't find out uh, that your pipeline doesn't run or doesn't fail. Exactly. Yep. Okay. See, let, let's see down here. I, let's say I limited uh, this. Uh, I, I wanted to reduce it to 100. Well, it, it's going to alert me and it's going to say not enough rows. Also, mm -hmm. let's say we looked, so at the very get-go, we looked at historic data and we saw that, okay, this is the distribution, you know, number of four ratings is, you know, always less than five, for example. We can encode that rule here and, and make sure that the number of ratings, there's an equal, not a, there's not an equal distribution of fours to fives. And of course, data does change over time. And then, but what you can do is you can account for that as time changes. But in the meantime, for historic data, uh, it shouldn't change that fast. Yeah. Uh, but if, that, if, that, you know, okay. trend... so with that, you can actually find out is is the data logically correct? Yep. Or are there some exactly exactly? And these are just heuristics. Story. There are you you can leverage uh, as many uh, open source tools out there as you want to do a lot of your data validation, data quality checks, things like that, that will detect drift, that will detect uh, change over time, uh, the values, the distribution over time, things like that. But this, these are more for, you know, simple, straightforward uh, rules. Cool. So then let me rerun this. So that, that's one way you can write these inline tests. Another way is you can use grid expectations. 
So let's go ahead and show you what that is. Like these power ups, you can mm -hmm. power up your pipeline with these cool extensions. So here's the great extension one. You can add an extension block. And again, everything's a block, so it can be reused. And this is powerful because you can have some expectation. So in great expectation, the expectation is, you know, I expect this data set to have this much value, uh, this range of value, et cetera. You can reuse this across different pipelines. So let's say you have one that says uh, an expect uh, a block of code that says you know, all columns better be clean, right? And then, and then, yeah. Okay. Let's say you have this. So now everyone on my team can add this to their pipeline and run this generic expectation on you know all their pipelines. But maybe I have uh, one that's specific to my pipeline. So I'm going to add that one right here. I'm going to paste in some code. And you know this you can read great expectations syntax. They have so many of these. But this is just saying we expect the table row count to be between 1,000 and 10,000. And what's great is I can select how many of these it runs on. So maybe I can have it run on actually all of them. Save. Mm -hmm. So now when I run my pipeline, what will happen is, okay, let's take a look at uh, these charts, uh, this tree. It'll run, run. And if any of these have an associated extension block, after these are done, these extension blocks are, are also ran. So, so after fetch data from API is done, this will run. So I can also test the run right now. I could click it. And this is what happens. Uh, what it does is the output of this is just ran through create expectations. And then mm -hmm. this method is called on that. Another thing that we do is we try to leave as much like a very specific API syntax in Mage out to make it very interoperable. For example, if you just removed, if you wanted to, you can remove, let's say this decorator, uh, just remove this. And now this pipeline, th this code, this pipeline snippet, it can be used anywhere. It can be used in AWS Lambda. It can be used in whatever other. You can run it on your command line. You don't need mage install. Uh, same thing with here. You, you can just you know, remove this. And this function just pass in a great expectation validator, and it will just run. So that was a very you know big design decision that we made. We wanted to make sure that you're not locked in, that your code can be reused anywhere, that it, it just makes sense. You, no one, people don't need to jump in and have to learn, uh, read a giant manual. And you shared before, Andreas, you know, how intuitive it was. And that, I think, comes part of it. How is it with the power-ups? Is that limited or can I, can I incorporate or integrate <laughs> So right. You can add custom power-ups. Right now, we, we shipped with the, the great expectation one, but we are constantly adding more and more. But you can absolutely okay. add, add your own. Okay. This is the one that it ships with currently. Okay. Cool. Um, before we move on. Yeah. Um, let me quickly check questions. Because as I saw here, this is a beta version. Like, um, is this the question here is is it a beta version how far are you in the the development of of mage yes yeah, so have we on your, on your roadmap we open sourced in june uh, 2022 uh so yeah. it's what do we have on our roadmap there's a link i can share with you uh, on the roadmap but it's uh it's a quite extensive roadmap <laughs> I, I it would take hours to go over all of it but what's really amazing and, and great is how healthy the community is it's a lot of the features are features that the community is asking for. I think a good sign of good community health is when when you can't work on, when I can't personally work on as many features that, as that I come with because there's just so many awesome features that the community is asking for and coming up with. And so we're just constantly working on those. So you know, we can share out you the public roadmap there. Uh, in addition to like, is a tool still in development? You know, we're, we're always, it, it's always day zero, like Amazon said, but we are production ready and there's quite a few companies using Mage in production. Uh, we even have a handful of companies have migrated 80, 90, 100 plus of their DAGs from Airflow 
uh, over to Mage. We have folks who migrate off of you know tools like Fivetran to build their integration pipelines plus their orchestration pipelines in Mage as well. Mm. I guess I guess Eka is coming here from from this direction. It looks <laughs> unbelievable that this tool is a community edition. <laughs> thank so. you, thank you, thank you. That means a lot. You know, we 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 really believe in making this a community tool. Also, you know, there's tools out there that have a lot of features that they they do feature gating where they say, oh, my user authentication, role based manage uh, role based access should be a paid feature. We we don't believe in that. We don't want feature gate anything. So we feel like those are table stakes. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm glad you, glad you liked it. That's nice to hear because like power ups, that sounds like, okay, you need to pay for the power ups. <laughs> <Yes. right? laughs> okay, yes. that's, that's a nice message that this, this stuff is free. Yep, yep, awesome. Okay, so yeah. the next phase I want to show you, so there's, there's two more. The next one is the scheduling, the triggering, all of that. And then the fast, oh last one will be the observability. So we had a pipeline here. Where was this? Was it this one? No, no, it was this one. Okay, we had a pipeline here. We are syncing data from one source to another. And then once this pipeline is done, we want that other pipeline. Actually, what was the name of that pipeline? Uh, it's this, this one. We want to run this one. Okay, we want to trigger it. So for this one, what we can do is, oh, there's three types of triggers. You can run this on a schedule. So I can say run this once, hourly, daily, weekly, et cetera. But what's really cool is you can have multiple schedules. Maybe you want to run hourly on the weekdays and maybe you want to run every six hours on the weekends because there's just not – the data doesn't get updated that frequently on the weekends. So you can create multiple schedules. A really, really advanced functionality. Uh, maybe I should show it here. Okay. Let's hypothetically say you want – this pipeline and this code. You see how it's fetching data from uh, just some URL. Pretend this URL can be scoped to a country. So we can do keyword args, get country, and pretend the URL goes something like this, country equals like that, right? Okay, so where does this keyword argument come from? It can come from multiple places. If you trigger this pipeline from an API call, that value is from the uh, request payload or you do this something like this you do variables so this variable is scoped to this pipeline so we said country right so maybe the default i'll just do is like us for example so automatically the this value this keyword argument is will be us and this is available anywhere i can do where country equals you know um, variables like that so this is accessible anywhere which is really really awesome depending on if you have sql python whatever okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna take that out okay so the next is what i what i want to get to was the part where we can do let's go back to here okay so i can create a schedule and i can me, name I, it for what was that i need to quickly step out for two minutes oh, I'm, I'm, no worries, no worries. I, I think that you just just okay. continue okay so here i can create a trigger right i could call it japan and let's say it runs hourly and i can override this so now i can do you know japan like that so i can have one pipeline make it really dynamic and have multiple schedules that pass in different variables and then i can do you know another one another thing i could do is i can do event based so let's say you have again i'm going to use aws example uh, let's say you have an event provider, AWS. I don't have it connected. But you can have this pipeline run every single time some sort of event fires. So let's say you have a custom event where someone uploads a file to S3 or deletes a file from S3. Then you can have this pipeline run on demand. And then finally, you can trigger this from an API call. So here it creates this very unique URL. You can make a post request from an external application. And... You pass in, in the, in the body of the post request, anything you pass in here will be accessible in your pipeline. So those are the three ways. So, okay, now that we know that, let's go back to our data integration pipeline. Let's create a trigger. Let's run this. Let's just run this daily. Actually, yeah, let's run this daily. Before I start this one, 
we want to run this pipeline. Then at, when it succeeds, run that other pipeline that we created with all those steps. So how do we do that? Here's a really cool way to do that. There's something called callbacks. So then let me just delete this real quick. So here, and this applies to not just data integration pipelines, but also your batch pipelines. So I can add a callback. I can do a base template, which again, is just you write your own Python function, or I can use something, uh, some template. So here, here's a template. This is just, again, code that was, we already wrote, makes it a lot easier. Behind the scenes, it's just making a post request to the other, it's just triggering the other pipeline via an API call. So then here I can paste in the name of the pipeline I want to trigger. And this is just one of many things you can do. If you really wanted to, you can you know print a statement out, you can log something in Datadog, you can make an API call to any of any other service you want. Use high touch, you know, trigger something in high touch if you want to do your reverse ETL. Okay, so here I can say this is a callback function for this last one. Okay, awesome. Now let's go ahead and run this. Okay, so we start this. So do the sync and then it should trigger the other pipeline. Okay, so let's take a look. Is it running? Yeah, it is running. Cool. Okay, nice. And then we can see if it, uh, look at the logs. Yeah, nice printed out logs. It's calculating metrics, great. Cool, cool, okay. All right, now let's go and take a look at the other one. Okay, awesome. So you can see here, it did run it. Great, cool. But let's go ahead and see why it failed. Okay, so it triggered it, amazing. Let's go ahead and take a look at the logs. And also, you can I could have got alerted for this as well. So we have uh, alertings. You can be alerted via email. You can be alerted via Teams, Slack, or Google Chat. Cool. Okay, so we can see the errors uh, decorated. Oh, of course, it's because I removed that one. So let's go ahead back here. Let's add that one back. Ta -da. It's going to fail again on this one, so I'm just going to delete that. I already know. Okay, cool. Let's save this. Great. Let's go back to our triggers. We can just go back here and rerun the failed jobs. Cool. Okay. Cool. So what's really awesome here as well is you can go back in time to a block, to a run, click on it, and then see the output, a sample of the output Ooh. here as well. Nice. Okay, so this one failed. Uh, let's see, I probably wrote something wrong again. Oh yeah, of course. I wrote something. Yeah, wrong. we modified it a bit earlier. Yes. I think. Yep. Yep. Yeah, just this. Okay. Let's run that. Cool. And what's again? What's great is I don't have to run everything again. I just run it from the failed one. And then they'll just run through them all. See, so you see how this doesn't depend on anything that didn't depend, that this upstream was done. So they ran in, in concurrently. Okay, so that is the orchestration piece. Let's and, jump. And, yep. and you can immediately see how long did every stage here take. I think that might be something where people also struggle optimizing your pipeline finding out okay where where am i losing all that time suddenly i think that's a that's a that's something that is very valuable yep oh yeah this is um the, the expectation failed because the see the expectation failed that worked awesome so i can go back here take a look the expectation wasn't actually supposed to be called for that so then i can just remove that one from there yeah uh, you you demoed it can add it to more. No, it's working the way it ex we the expectation is working as expected. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we can go back here and then click on this, click on this, and then just retry from that. And then also, let's see monitor. I, I do want to go into the monitor piece. So let me find one that's been running already. Uh, okay, maybe this one has some good stuff. 
Okay, so here's some oh backfilling. I forgot to talk about backfilling. We make backfilling really easy. Uh, you can create a backfill here. I can say the start date, maybe you know this date, and then this date. And what's really cool is you can change the interval. Maybe, maybe you created a pipeline that wasn't daily. Maybe it was mm -hmm. hourly. Okay, cool. Let's let's backfill every hour between those, or you can go even more granular. Maybe six hours. Let's backfill every six hours. Look, uh, you know, these are all the backfills they will do for you. So we'll run all of those with those execution dates. Okay, so let's look at logs. We have very structured logs. The logs are by default written to disk or the file system that it's running on. But you can optionally have an X uh, write to you know some remote bucket. And there's it's structured logs. So you can see the time, the block it's associated with, the message, etc. And you can really drill down into each each log as well to debug it. In your own code, you can also output to the logs if you want to do your own logging. And then for monitoring, here you can see uh, which one's canceled, completed, failed. Mm -hmm. You can also break it down by the schedule. So maybe I shared before, you know, let's say you had a different schedules for different countries. Maybe one keeps breaking because there's too much data or, or it's out of memory, et cetera. You can also break it down by the blocks, uh, the block runs. And then I, I don't have, actually, let me see if I have uh, one that ran for multiple days. Okay, I don't have it here, but there is a, we do track the, we, we do track how long it takes over time. So I just ran this once. So, but you can see it ran for six seconds. But what's great about that is it, it shows, it basically shows this time right here, these times uh, right here. And so then you can over time see, hey, my pipeline is taking longer and longer to finish, but my data is not my data is growing linearly, but the time it's taking to finish is growing exponentially. Oh, something might be wrong. So we do track that. Mm -hmm. And then we also do, we don't display it, but we do track the, the CPU and the memory that uh, the RAM that is, can, is used on each run. Uh, we'll soon display that in the dashboard so that then you can also see, hey, this pipeline is costing more money because it's consuming more resources over time as well. So that's the observability piece. Uh, do that... you have one 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 question? Do you have because in Airflow you have that overview of okay, this is the run, this was each run, and this was basically green, 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 green. You know what I mean? Where you see each every each stage, this day these stages were green. Here's here's something failed, um, and then there were for for every run. Do you have something comparable to that? For every oh so yeah you can see like the the runs like this. These are so each of your run these are each of your runs and then you can click into them the run and see the details of the run. Okay, yeah, yep, yep. Okay, cool. Like uh, let me find one that failed for example, or I can see all of them right here. So yeah, I can see this failed one. Uh, jump into it. Look at this one. Right. See why it failed. Jump mm -hmm. into the logs. I see this one, you know, threw an error down here, right? Something crazy. Go fix it. Yeah. yeah. Debugging is really easy, really fast, really enjoyable. Okay. Yeah. And that concludes uh, the workshop. There's a lot of other, actually, yeah, there's a lot of other advanced features, but uh, you spend your whole weekend with me here. Yeah. I, from, from what we've seen, it's very versatile. You can do a lot of stuff. I like the connectors. And as you said, that it uses already created connectors. Yep. And um, basically, whenever the community comes up with something new, it, it will get into mage. Yep. Um, I think that is very valuable because if it's not open source or if it's if it's some, you know, you know how some softwares are you need to wait until the new connector is is brought in by the development team, which can take a yes. long time. Um, I think yep, yep. that makes it very easy. Um, there was a good question here. So uh, everybody, 
let's let's move into a Q&A. We're already like an hour and 45 minutes in. Let's move into a QA. and a like, Thanks for that extensive like demo and, and workshop of it. Um, if people want to, do you have something prepared for people where they should go to to try it out? Yeah, absolutely. There's is there a place I can write comments somewhere? Oh, um, but we have a, a few places, so maybe I can. There's that you could one. Just uh, bring it up in in on your on your um in oh, your yes. desktop uh, in a browser, yes, yes. and, I, and I, I show it. Yes, please, please, please. Um, you, you can share uh, my desktop and I can share some URLs. Do you want to first bring up the URLs and then we share the, the screen? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So here, like the docs, yep. Yep. So if you just go to docs.mage.ai, everything you need is, is here. You can uh, quickly get set up, right? So here's a setup, very easy setup. Run a Docker install. Here's some really great tutorials, you know, a quick ETL pipeline, or if you want to do a data integration pipeline, or if you have DBT and you want to learn how to orchestrate, add your existing DBT project, or if you want to build a cool little machine learning pipeline, you can do that there as well. And another thing, if you want to watch a quick video, we highly recommend you join our community Slack channel. You, know, you get instant help there. That's a place where you can you know, vent, you can share, you can ask for things, ask anybody in there how fast our response time is and how fast our uh, our feature release is, and you'll be, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Mm. Okay, that's good. Um, there was a question. Uh, we were talking about Airflow. We, you, we've seen how easy Mage is to <laughs> use. The qu that's a very good question from Amiri here. What does the migration from Airflow to Mage look like? And how heavy is the lift to to do this? Yeah, great what, question. What's your experience in this? Great question. It really it really depends. So it depends on how tangled the your DAGs are. If if you have if you have a giant file with the, the DAGs that are just all the tasks are in there and if they're not functional, they're not put in functions and you just everything's in line. That's a little trickier, but we're working on we're working on a tool that will parse that and then produce your blocks for Mage. The thing is, if now that's on the hard side. The easy side is if you have a bunch of utility functions, you have a single file that's just the DAG that imports those functions. That's actually really easy because, as you saw before, in a Mage pipeline, all it do is doing is executing functions inside specific files. So that makes it a lot easier to migrate and you don't need a special tool for that. So, but if you're on that far right side where you just have a lot of uh, a giant DAG, you know, everything's tangled, we'll, we'll have a tool for you to just easily convert that into separate Python scripts that then you can just construct inside of mage. Oh, that's a cool, that would, that would be a cool feature. <laughs> yes. Cool feature. Um, Andy was also asking here, a uh, really good demo. Yeah. So congrats. thank you. Thanks. Um, are you working on a cloud offering? We were talking about it, but maybe, maybe yeah. it would be good if you. Absolutely. You absolutely. That. You know, so we scaling made simple, easy developer experience. That is a core design principle of ours. So we'll continue to make it super easy for a team of one or a, a one person to be able to support a giant team to be able to deploy, scale, maintain very easily. But there will always be folks who just want to use a cloud offering. So in about 12 to 18 months, we'll, we'll provide that. We'll, we'll open it up for there to be, uh, you can use it on the cloud. Hmm. And most likely then the, actually the move from a local install to the cloud will be very simple, right? Yep. Because of the structure and how to, Yep. Bring that. Um, oh, here, Sergio asked something, right? About the observability. It's, it's yeah, just... let me bring it up. About the observability, uh, is it just tracking of executions or can uh, you create alerts? If they create alerts, they are only thresholds or can you use uh, deviations? Great question. So for the alerts, 
the alerts are on a pipeline level project level you can and it's on a status so let's say a pipeline fails cancels completes you can get alerted from that now on the failed part that's probably the most uh, fun part the pipeline can fail in many ways let's just say it's a code error that's just going to fail right it's just binary yes failed no failed there's a syntax error but in terms of the data quality the data validation piece those thresholds that you're talking about that's something you just write yourself so you remember there's two ways there's the uh, the inline test decorator in there you can say you know the number of rows should be anywhere between x percentage of you know some giant number or you Great Expectations has a lot of this built in. It has a lot of those thresholds, like the distribution, variability, things like that. So they have a lot of those built in. And you can use Great Expectations power up, apply them to some of your blocks. And then as your as your pipeline's running, if it if it's within that threshold, it won't fail. If it's outside that threshold, you saw earlier, one of our uh, our pipelines failed because it didn't meet the expectation. And so then I would have got alerted for that. Mm. As you mentioned, on Slack or on Teams or yep. email and so on. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry. Very, very <laughs> nice talking with you. Yeah. I think a lot of people learned a lot about pipelines, about how were the problems, how to do it right, um, what options they have with Mage, uh, how simple it actually is. Um, well, thanks a lot for this. Um, Thank you. Where should people go? Mage AI? Yes. Right? If, if you, I would love everyone to go to mage.ai slash chat, C-H-A-T. That's the best okay. way to get in touch with us. You know, we're, we're lively group. The community is lively. We're always just having fun. So we'd love to see you all there. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts, your feedback. If you have questions. I can, you know, have one-on-ones with folks. We can hop on some calls. We can do more demos, more training. Uh, would love to see you all there. Very nice. And also give it a try, right? In the documentation, yes, you have the, the the quick setup, how to yep. run it. Yep. I give it a try. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so again, thanks, Tommy. Thanks, everybody else, for being here, for the great questions. I think we had some really great questions, right? Yes, we did. It was very interesting questions. Um, and then have a great one. See you, everyone. See, See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.